Good day and welcome to the first of our uh, online recorded video versions of the lectures for NR530, I'm sorry, NR323. We'll see how many of these errors actually get into the final, um, the final edit. So, our first uh, topic of these lectures is image enhancement. Um, and what we're interested in here now is spectral enhancement. We've talked about spatial enhancement, where we uh, take um, the spatial information of adjacent pixels and record it using uh, mathematical convolution kernels. In this case, what we're interested in is highlighting the information that's in uh, various spectral bands in such a way that we can combine information to simplify the, the key patterns that we're interested in. And of course, one of the first ways we can do this is simply to do band selection. That is, um, some bands are more useful than uh, other bands uh, that we might be using. And selecting the, the bands of interest, either for visualization or uh, for processing by other techniques is an important way that you can uh, enhance spectral data. So for instance, we know that blue and green are bands that are most uh, impacted by atmospheric effects. And furthermore, we know that for many purposes, they can be ignored. I mean, if you're doing water analysis, uh, then you know, you're gonna wanna keep that blue in, but if you're interested in, for instance, soils or vegetation, blue is not that important. Bands from red um, through the mid-infrared are mostly unaffected by the atmosphere, and they capture most of the important information in an image. So if you think back to the spectral curves that we've looked at, um, the key features um, are generally not in blue and green. You know, with soil, you know, all of the visible is pretty much equally informative. So you can use the red band for a bit, uh, and you might want to contrast that with the infrared or the mid infrared. For vegetation, again, you can use red to get at the pigmentation near infrared to get at the cellular structure and the mid infrared for um, getting at any kind of uh, water content impacts. So um, really you can um, look at uh, the visible, the near infrared and the mid infrared and get most of the information that is in those images um, and ignore certain other bands. Another way that we can enhance spectral information is by using image ratios. Now, we know that in images, very often a lot of the variability is just due to which images are bright and which images are, um, I'm sorry, which parts of the images are bright and the parts of the images that are dark. Uh, and we know a lot of that information has to do with things that are not um, particular to the ground surface itself. We know that uh, the amount of solar illumination as affected by slope and aspect uh, is a very important uh, predictor of the total brightness of any given area. And that's not, really what we're usually interested in, in terms of our analyses. So we might want to look at different types of objects while canceling out their overall brightness. And that's in one sense what an image ratio do, does. Um, it's one of the most common transformations that people use. And because it um, removes the overall brightness signal. Um, 
it can highlight more subtle variations in the spectral responses of, of various surface covers. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the other way you can think of the importance of spectral or the utility of spectral ratioing is that it enhances variations in the slopes of the spectral reflectance curve. So, um, you know, for instance, if we look at the red edge there uh, and we look at the ratio of, uh, say, the gray loam, that orange line, that um, the ratio of that value to the value uh, of it for red, okay, that's going to be a, a small um, value above one because it's a little higher in the infrared. Um, if we look at vegetation, on the other hand, near infrared versus red, you're going to get a much higher um, ratio because there's much there's a much higher slope between red and near infrared for that type of uh, surface than is for soil. So here's a mathematical um, approach to this, and I've just realized that my my lovely face is. Um, overlapping. This will have to be redone. Um, we're looking here at two layer, uh, two um, uh, types of cover, deciduous cover or broadleaf and coniferous or needle leaf cover. And we're looking at it on two sides of a slope, one facing southward, presumably the other northward. And so we have sunlit south and shadowed portions of the landscape. Um, and then the question here is, can we determine which uh, vegetation is deciduous and which is coniferous? Now, if we look at the raw numbers here, uh, what we see is that um, the sunlit um, coniferous and deciduous vegetation both have relatively high numbers, 48, 50, 31, 45, and for both cover types, the shadowed uh, areas have much lower, um, sorry, much lower values. And so if you were just looking at these absolute values, these absolute digital numbers that we have here, you might say, well, how are we going to tell one from another? Um, and the answer is that if we compute a ratio instead of just using the values, what we see is that deciduous vegetation, the ratio between uh, band A and band B is much more similar, uh, no matter whether it's on the sunlit or shadowed part of the uh, landscape, then is um, the values for the sunlit and shadowed portion of the coniferous forest, which has a lower ratio. So you can see here that you can take out that illumination effect and give you yourself more information about the land surface itself than if you simply used raw digital numbers. And there are a variety of ratios that we use in order to summarize spectral information this way. Uh, one set for vegetation ratios. So we have the simple vegetation ratio, also known as the ratio, I'm sorry, the simple vegetation index, also known as the ratio vegetation index, and the NDVI, which is the most popular of this index, is this type of index, the normalized difference vegetation index. So SVI is just NIR over red. NDVI is NIR minus red over NIR plus red. And that just helps get rid of any additional information, any additional signal about the relative brightness dividing by that NIR plus red. Here's a, a 
uh, an image example where we're looking at the first, uh, we're looking at band four and band three for the same area. This is, you know, our local scene. You can see where it's to right there toward the middle. And um, what you see is uh, a lot of topography, particularly if you look about two thirds of the way up either image um, toward the left half of the image, what you'll see is a, a horizontal feature. That horizontal feature is the, um, the Poudre Canyon. Okay. And you can see the Poudre Canyon because you're seeing difference is in illumination. The south facing half of the Poudre Canyon is more brightly lit than is the north facing uh, half. And throughout that entire area, you can see topographic features um, um, very distinctly uh, just based on the effect that they have on the amount of illumination. Now we've taken those two bands and calculated a simple ratio and the NDVI. And what you see is that you've taken away most of the variability associated with topography. Now there's still a topographic signature left and the remaining signature is due to the fact that just as sunlit and, um, and shadowed portions of the landscape uh, affect the images that we're taking, they also affect the vegetation. So for instance, south facing slopes are going to get more highly illuminated and therefore they're also going to tend to be drier than north facing slopes. So we see that effect here and we also see some absolute elevation effects where at the lower elevation we have lower NDVI simply because those areas don't receive as much precipitation. Um, the other thing that we see in this image is that in fact the agricultural areas to the front range to the right of either one of these images is uh, much greener, has higher uh, greenness indices than does vegetation. I'm sorry, natural vegetation in this scene. So we know that there's there are what we refer to as redundant bands. When we looked at contrast enhancement and we looked at multivariate statistics, particularly the correlation coefficient for examining the relationship with bands, we found that there's a correlation in general, positive or negative between different bands and particularly the closer bands are together in the spectrum the more correlation there is the higher correlation um, than there is between them now when we say higher correlation that can be a we mean the magnitude of the correlation so it can be a high positive or a high negative value that both count as high correlations and so we know that individual bands are correlated with each other. And we have an approach that gets rid of those correlations called principal components analysis. Okay. We have correlations. Sometimes we refer to that as covariance between bands. And PCA goes in and finds the bands that are most highly correlated um, that basically all reflect the same type of effect in the image, whether that effect is just overall brightness or the extent to which um, near infrared and red responses are contrasting, that is vegetation signal. And it extracts a series of bands of information and in which each, the first band explains the, the largest pattern it extracts the largest pattern of information within the image um, and then goes on and finds the next largest um, or most important pattern within the image. And the effect of this is to um, reduce the number the, of bands in the image in, in effect. So if we have seven bands, seven band TM image, and that image um, 
has redundant information, then we're going to find that, and, and they always do, um, we're going to find that the number of principal components is going to be fewer than the number of the original bands. Now, when you do the calculation, you can bring out as many of the bands as you want. You can predict out of a, a seven band image up to uh, seven bands of principal components. But as we'll see, the first few principal components is going to explain almost all of the information that's in the image. Okay, we're going to extract all the important patterns. And so you no longer need to have those higher numbered uh, principal components. So for a typical six or seven band TM image, you might find that you only need three principal components to explain almost all of the variability in the original image. So this is a, a scatter plot um, and it's a, a matrix of scatter plots. So we've looked at these before, you know, if you want to see what um, is in, you know, what the scatter plot between values of TM band one and TM band two are, then you look at the, the intersection of those two labels. So from TM two, you go up one box and from TM one, you go to the right one box. And that's that relationship. Essentially, each one of these labels, both the X and the Y axis of adjacent boxes. Okay. So if you look at TM4 and TM5, um, TM4 is essentially labeling that those letters labeling the, the Y axis of the box to its right and the X axis um, of the box above it. And in fact, TM4, all of the X axis on the column label TBM4, TM4 is the variable being plotted on the X. Um, whereas for say the, the row that's labeled TM5, the Y axis, is always TM5. And so when you have that interaction or intersection between TM4 and TM5, that plot to the upper right of where it says TM4 and TM5, um, that is a graph of thematic mapper band 5 versus on the X and thematic mapper uh, band 4 on the Y. Now, because this is a, a plot of each variable against each other, you have duplicates. That is, if you look in the upper left, you've got the um, unshaded, you know, the box I have not shaded out. That's a graph of TM1 versus TM2. If you look in the other intersection between TM1 and TM2, that's actually the graph of TM2 versus TM1. So we don't need to look at half of those. But what we see is a variety of patterns. That is, for bands one through four, those all look pretty highly correlated. Um, you know, and that's generally true in Landsat images that the, uh, the visible and the near infrared bands are highly correlated to each other. Okay. Now, as we go down, we can see that TM1, TM2, and, and TM3 three and four are not highly correlated with TM five, six, and seven. Remember here that TM six would be the thermal band because in Landsat, the, the bands are out of order with respect to their, um, their wavelength designation. But you can see that the visible is not highly correlated with the mid infrared. The mid infrared bands five and seven are not highly correlated with band six. The one that other combination that are highly correlated are TM5 and TM7, which are both mid infrared bands. And this graph just shows that there is um, the amount of redundancy between two bands is generally a function of 
how similar those bands are, how close they are in the spectra. So visible bands and near infrared bands look like each other for the most part. Mid infrared bands look like each other. Thermal doesn't look anything like either of the other two. So visible components can be understood by just starting with a, a simplified plot of two bands. Okay, so we're not going to show uh, the points between these bands. Okay, we're just going to use this oval to represent, you know, the the interval in which 95% of the uh, points are plotted. So if you imagine points points in there, you can say, well, this is these are two bands that have a a fairly good uh, amount of correlation uh, between the two. Okay, so we have two bands x1 and x2, and we're going to start by um, noting where the uh, mean value is for each one. So you have mu, mu1 should be on the x axis, I don't know where the one went to, and mu2 on the y axis. So the first thing we do is we create a new um, center of our graph. So the new center is mu1 and mu2, okay? And the reason we do that is we're gonna rotate the data around that point, okay? Just, it, it is exactly the what I'm saying. It's as if you took that oval and rotated it um, around its center point. And we want to do the rotation around the center point, which is why we need to calculate the two mean values first. And we think of that as a new coordinate system. And the calculation for the new coordinates is just the old value of the coordinate minus the mean value uh, along that axis or for that band. Now, I've drawn a lawn axis through that um, that oval um, and that long axis has the property of ex having the the largest degree of contrast you can think right if you drew a line through the the minimum and the maximum on the x-axis you would have its range if you did the same on the y-axis you would have its range but both of those ranges would be less than the length along that diagonal axis because um, because they just do mathematically and um, because this line has the property of having the longest range um, it explains the most variance okay that's the, the key portion here is that that longest line um, has explained more variation than either the range in X or the range in Y, okay? So now we've updated some of our graphical elements here. And so, um, we've created not only a new center point for our uh, our projection we're now going to create two new um, axes one of them principal component one going through the, the the long axis of that oval and the second one principal component two that goes um, uh, perpendicular to um, the first axis so the way we've defined it, this oval looking, you know, demonstrating or, or representing the total range of values or almost the entire range of values, PC1 is going to explain most of the variance in the overall data set, the largest range of values, okay? Principal component two is then going to explain the most remaining variability okay and the second property 
of this is that so we have the first principal component explaining most variance principal component two explaining the second largest amount of variance um there's no longer a correlation between the values on principal component one and principal component two okay um you know, essentially two items are as different as can be when they're oriented at right angles to each other. No matter what the, the value on principal component one, the, there's no trend now in how principal component cha two changes with principal component one. And that, that trend is what we call the correlation or the, um, I'm doing something, Clara. You have to go around the other way. It'll be interesting to see if I leave that in the edit too. So, um, so we now have done what we've set out to do, which is to remove the relationship between these two bands and replaced it with two new values, principal component one score and principal component two score. And the way you, you calculate those scores is, you know, something called the eigenanalysis, which we're not gonna get into. But if you have a point like the orange point shown, you can see its score on the axes is just the projected location of that point um, onto the new set of axes. So here's an example of the principal components. Um, there's a mislabel in the top column there. That's principal components one, two, and three. Um, and the first principal component in the upper left there, what you're seeing is, uh, again, for the local scene, just brightness and darkness. This is just the average brightness and darkness for each pixel. Um, principle component two then um, shows you the second greatest source of pattern or contrast that you've got. And in that case, you can see that we're looking at very bright areas for the agricultural and residential areas along the front range muted, you know, moderate values for the um, natural vegetation, uh, forested areas, and then very low values up in North Park, um, where um, there's Are relatively little vegetation. I am doing something right now on, the, oh. on this, and it's listening to me talk. So I need to go back and do this now, okay? Okay. And then the third principal component you can see, um, and this highlights a, a complexity in using uh, principal components analysis. You can see that low values of the third principal components are associated with um, those dark areas. Those are high elevation snow areas. they are also dark areas for any wet areas. And um, um, that is actually highlighting water, okay? But with principal components, it's kind of a, a crapshoot whether you are going to get high values or low values for, for a particular effect. It's actually mathematically, it could go either way just on the basis of small changes. So you might not get for instance, a vegetation effect as your second principal component, but what you might get is an inverse vegetation effect. Uh, and that you just have to change your interpretation to note that low values are associated with vegetation and high values, the lack of vegetation. In this particular example, vegetation comes out the way you would expect it to um, with high values indicating high amounts of vegetation. But this third principal component, which is related to the amount of uh, uh, water, um, so snow uh, and, and open water bodies. In this case, 
it's actually an index of the absence of water, right? So where there's water, you have low values. Where you have high values, you have less water. And then on the bottom, we're showing one of the real advantages of principal components. Um, we can display principal components in such a way that we're explaining most of the variation, and we'll just see how much in a minute. Most of the variation is being explained in just three principal components. And the nice thing is we can display three principal components all at the same time. Um, we don't um, um, we don't have to worry about swapping back and forth between seven bands, taking three bands at a time. We can look at almost all the information in the same uh, in a single view. Um, and here I've just got some other examples. Um, so then I've plotted principal components four, three, and two as an image. And one thing you should start to notice, and this is particularly evident with principal components six, five, and four, is there's not a lot of contrast in the image. And that's because as we go from the first principal component to the sixth principal component, we are um, looking at images that have less and less information in them. Uh, and so they just don't show the same amount of contrast. So principal component transformation is, we think of it as a rotation of the original axis to new orientations that are orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. And therefore there's, there's little or no correlation between variables. We have a set of independent indices, the principal components, that we can use without thinking about how correlated individual bands are. Um, first principal component is always going to explain the maximum amount of variation, okay? And the first three principal components of a Landsat image generally contain over 90% of the information. And in fact, you know, it's generally like 93 or above. And then, as I've said, the higher principal components generally have um, lower contrast. Very often what you're looking at is, is not spatially structured information. You're looking at various sources of noise. So for instance, if you're dealing with MSS data, multispectral scanner data from the early Landsat satellites, what you'll find is that there's, um, you might see the, be the, um, the effect of the, um, sorry, the line striping, the differences in the sensitivity of each of the six sensors. And that will show you, um, that will show up as its own principal component. Here's another way to look at this. So what I've done is shown on the left, uh, six of the TM bands, one, two, three, four, five, and seven. And what you see is the spatial pattern is very similar in those six bands. You know, you're seeing that same overall spatial pattern um, in each one of those, you know, roads. We've also got some um, drainage features there. When we look at the principal component, only the first, the on the right, principal components one through six, only the first component shows the overall spatial pattern, okay? And then the second principal component is gonna show you a second source of spatial pattern that is unrelated to the first and so on. Principal component three has some pattern in it. Principal component four has some pattern in it. Principal components five and six, um, if you can look at them in magnification, you'd see there's no spatial pattern there. Principal components three and four, you would in this circumstance generally think of as, as relatively unimportant. They don't seem to be showing a lot of um, spatial pattern that you can't see in principal component two. And so 
it's likely mathematical artifacts that um, are holding up. So you could count principal components one through three um, or one through two um, as the ones that are significant coming out of this principal components analysis. Um, here's another example. Again, 6TM bands on the left, and you're seeing the similar patterns in each one of, um, you know, see the same spatial features in each one of the bands. On the right, um, really only um, bands one and two have strong spatial patterning, and they're distinct. So you're not seeing the same areas having high and low values. That's because they're decorrelated. Principal components three through six all appear to be noise in one way or another. And here's that example again, and it's it's easily seen uh, in this particular example that if you look at that last principal component there, you're seeing sensor noise predominantly, those little streaks. Um, and I'm not sure um, where those streaks are coming from. They look like memory effects where high values have then sort of depressed future um, spectral values a little bit. So um, one can actually do an analysis where you take an original set of bands, principal component transform them, and then back transform a subset of the principal components. So you could take a, a six band TM image, transform it to a principal components analysis. You keep the information that's used to do the transformation, but then you use only say the first three or four principal components and back transform the image. And essentially you've cleaned the image up from some of that noise. It's just a, a little more complicated uh, analysis. So why do we use principal components analysis? Well, it decorrelates spectral data, okay? We know that multispectral bands are highly correlated because of, there's just correlations in how materials respond to similar wavelengths, right? Things are just generally bright or, or not. They reflect a lot or not. Um, and so adjacent bands or near adjacent bands have similar spectral patterns. Um, topography, okay, this is illumination effect, essentially sunlit and shadowed. That's an effect that is going to lead to correlations between what digital numbers are recorded for a particular band. And then also sometimes the, in some sensors, the bands are either touching or overlap. And if they overlap, then you definitely do get an additional source of correlation from that overlap. Um, so decorrelation of the spectral bands, it, it separates out your original set of N bands into a smaller number of uh, principal components um, that can be interpreted separately. There's no effect of one band on the next band. And then it compresses the variance. So for instance, particularly when we were, you know, years ago when I was a boy, we, it was difficult to work with a 250 megabyte piece, uh, uh, TM image. So very often we would do the transformation with principal components, set aside just a, a few bands from that, three, maybe four, and then um, operate on those bands for further analysis. So why not use principal components analysis? Well, it's if you're looking at multiple scenes from different areas, you wouldn't want to use a principal, you might not want to use a principal component, and that's because it's data dependent. So the transformation is different from scene to scene. Um, 
So we're going to be, if we transform three images with three principal components, we would have to go through a process of interpreting what the principal components did. So you might have two images. The first band of each image is going to be um, the maximum variability that was explainable in each image, but um, they might reflect different patterns of what kinds of objects were brightest and or not as bright, different spectral patterns. So they're not directly comparable. You have to go through a process of understanding how the principal components relate to your original bands. Um, spectral details, particularly if you have just small areas that are not, that are unlike the rest of the image, um, the details of the spectra in those areas may be lost if you ignore the higher order principal components. If you have a small area that has a contrasting spectral pattern, because it's small, it's not gonna explain that much variance. And therefore it's going to be uh, relegated to those higher order principal components that we wanna get rid of in general. So we could lose those spectral details. Um, it's computationally expensive, that is, you know, it takes a long while to run for large images, but um, this gets easier and easier all the time. And you have to calculate what's known as the, the covariance matrix. So that's the, the degree of correlation between individual bands. And that's the culprit is calculating that covariance matrix and then doing the, the Eigen analysis on that covariance matrix. So principal components are analysis is different for every scene. I mean, it's very similar for similar scenes, but um, it's still theoretically separate. Um, but the idea of reducing an image into a smaller number of spectral patterns is a good one in general. And um, what, what uh, some folks at Purdue back in the 70s thought to themselves was, well, what if we could create an image that just uh, uh, represented particular spectral patterns that we're interested in? Um, like the principal components analysis, but our coefficients will be the same from um, every uh, every image, okay? So we'll be able to interpret the resulting images the same way, um, no matter where the image was from. And so from that work was derived something called the tassel cap transformation. And it's similar to the PCA, but it uses the same coefficients um, to create the tassel cap bands, whereas PCA is deriving the coefficients from the image itself. Why is it called the tassel cap? Well, the first two tassel cap indices are brightness and greenness. And on the left, we've plotted pixel values for brightness and greenness. And you know, I didn't make this up. If you look at it, you can see that it looks like a hat, okay? Um, so that's the cap. And then the tassels are the little pixels that kind of fly off from the peak of the hat, okay? That are just always there. I don't think they represent anything in particular, but so they looked at it and said, it looks like a tasseled cap, again, I didn't make this up, um, they did. So like PCA, tassel cap transforms the Landsat data into a reduced set of bands, um, but the pixel values are transformed in a standard way. When you're dealing with Landsat um, thematic mapper data, the three remaining or resulting bands are termed 
brightness, greenness, and wetness. And that should give you some idea of what each one represents. For multispectral scanner data, it doesn't have the mid-infrared band that you need to calculate wetness. Therefore, you have brightness, greenness, and yellowness. But yellowness is not very useful. So generally, people just use brightness and greenness. So the tassel cap transformation, uh, it was created at Purdue, Indiana, agricultural state. It was developed to track crop development. So if you look at the graph on the left and you look at the origin of those arrows, that shows you where crops um, start at the beginning of a field. I'm sorry, beginning of a season. So um, they have relatively high brightness because you're seeing mostly soil background and soils are bright. As the plant canopy and it has low greenness. It has low greenness because there's no green material yet. As the plants grow, the brightness goes down, okay, because you're not seeing as much soil and the greenness goes up. At a certain point, the plants get thinned enough that the brightness returns and you reach that peak value of greenness. After the peak greenness portion is is done you get plant senescence and plants remain the same brightness but decrease in greenness until they're ready you know they're dry and ready for harvest so that was the original application it was agriculture um, if you look at other kinds of land cover they fall out very nicely within this tassel cap um, distribution. So within the tassel cap, that's where you see most agriculture and you would also see, um, as we term them, recreational grasses, i.e. lawns and ball fields and stuff. Um, immediately outside the tassel cap to the lower left, that's where you have things that are, are dark and not very green. So clear water shows up there. Um, you have things that are a little brighter but not green and so turbid water shows up right there and as you get to the highest brightness and lowest greenness those are concrete urban rock kind of surfaces um, and then forests and natural vegetation um, generally are are in general greener than what you're going to have from vegetation now we know that um, in fact in colorado um, forest and natural vegetation are not going to be greener than the crop vegetation um, because there just simply isn't enough water here. But in Indiana, forest natural vegetation would in fact fall up there. And the nice thing is, is this space can be interpreted the same way for any Landsat or, or similar image that you're looking at so that you can see, oh, if those points are down near the origin, then those are going to be clear water points. So TASCAP is specifically designed for each band of Landsat imagery. The same coefficients can be applied the same way each and every time. And so this is fundamentally different than the PCA in which each scene is going to generate a unique set of components based on the data values. And here we have an example of the individual bands that come from a uh, uh, thematic mapper. We have brightness, um, greenness, wetness. Now, wetness is going to give you um, a, either, wetness refers to th three things. Three kinds of things are wet. Um, water is wet. Um, snow is wet and needle leaf forests are wet. Now that isn't to say that that's because they have water on them. It's that the way that mid infrared energy, which is predominantly related to wetness, the way that mid infrared radiation is scattered in 
needle leaf forest canopies gives it a spectral um, gives it spectral qualities that are similar to the effect of water. And so we say coniferous forests are wet. As it turns out, in the Pacific Northwest, where you have lots of conifer forests, um, as forest canopies get older, they become more wet. Um, that is, they have more of this wetness. And in fact, it's the, the best optical method for determining forest age can is derived from using this wetness value to predict age. And then you also get uh, three other bands, haze, which just shows you how much, how much atmospheric um, uh, effect there is in a particular area. And then the imaginatively named fifth and sixth. And no, no one I know ever uses haze fifth and sixth. So it's, it's really just from Landsat TM, brightness, greenness, and wetness, from Landsat MSS, brightness, greenness, and yellowness. And again, since we've got three bands, we can uh, display them all at one um, in one image. So red is always assigned to brightness. Okay, so the areas that are red are generally areas without um, uh, a lot of vegetation cover, like in the northeast of town here, where we have a lot of, um, you know, relatively bare rangeland. The other areas that are bright are um, snow, you can see in the lower left hand corner. Um, greenness, uh, the things that are going to be green, now we don't see any green objects here. And that's because greenness is being expressed in two colors that you can see, one of which is yellow for agricultural areas. So those are areas where you've got a lot of greenness and a lot of brightness. Okay, so brightness is red, as displayed as red, greenness is displayed as green. So if things are bright and green, then they're going to be displayed as yellow. The other area where there are green objects are the forested areas to the west of town, and those are displayed as cyan. Uh, and the reason they're displayed as cyan is that it's coniferous vegetation. And so as a consequence, um, that vegetation shows up as both being green um, and wet because of that um, needle leaf um, wetness effect. So you can know pretty easily what you're looking at at any portion in this image. In the lower left, we have an area that's red to purple. That's ice. Um, so it's bright and it's wet. We have those cyan forests. So we know those are coniferous forests because they're green and wet. We have not a lot of green areas here because we don't have a lot of deciduous forests. And where we do have deciduous forest, the signature is mixed with the um, with urban areas because you know if we could see some small patches of aspen, then those would appear green. We have orangish areas, which are areas that are bright um, and not quite as green, so areas with less vegetation. Um, we have yellowish areas that are bright and green, so it's agriculture. And we have water bodies which are blue because they're wet and neither bright nor green. Um, finally, we do have some patches that are kind of magenta-ish, and those would be areas probably of um, irrigated fields. So they would be bright so that would give you the red part of the signature and they would have some wetness. So that would be the blue part of the signature. Um, and these patterns are the same for all task capped images. So you can look at a task capped image and know what it's telling you with just a little uh, experience with these kind of interpretations. So castle cap pros and cons, why use it? It's a fixed reference. Um, 
And so if you want to figure out what's going on in an image, this gives you a simple way to look at the, the three primary, um, you know, um, you can think of them as, as the three primary or principal components, right? Even though we're not using principal components here, we're still in general in most scenes looking at brightness, greenness, and wetness um, as being the most three most important effects spectrally. We're looking at them all at the same time using a single um, display of the image. Um, that allows you to have consistent interpretation from scene to scene. And that interpretation is rather than just being a spectral, um, having a spectral interpretation, it has a real geophysical properties interpretation, how bright something is, how green it is, how much of this mid infrared response does it have. Why not use the tassel cap? Um, it does not, if you just use those three bands, it's not giving you all of the information that's in the image. So um, you're losing some information for a lot of purposes though, that's an, an okay trade-off to make because you're not gonna be losing stuff that is particularly interesting. And it does require um, um, for, to set it up for new sensors requires a relatively complex multi-temporal analysis. Um, but it exists for uh, Landsat, it exists for MODIS. I would bet it exists for Sentinel, although I don't know for sure.